Lisa Eldridge and I'm a professional makeup artist. Over my career, I must have made up thousands of faces from catwalk models to magazine covers and celebrities on the red carpet. Makeup can be seen as a frivolous subject, but I think it's hugely important. What we believe to be beautiful is a window on the world we're living in. As a makeup artist working in the fashion industry, my goal is always to create something which is modern, ideally to create future trends. But to do that, I'm constantly looking back in time. I've been collecting vintage makeup for the last 30 years and I'm fascinated by what it can tell us. I love the aesthetic of that, isn't, isn't it modern? It gorgeous? In this series, I'm looking at some iconic eras in our history, each with radically different perceptions of beauty. Everyone wanted to be cafe au lait, like Josephine Baker. Yeah. And I want to find out what these looks say about the age. Here we have <gasps> Georgina's hair. <gasps> I'll be researching original techniques and trying them on our model, Queenie. It's so easy to blend. They were onto something. <laughs> Scouring through recipe books, I'll make products that haven't seen the light of day for hundreds of years. It's just so incredibly natural. Almost looks like you're blushing from within. And for the more dangerous formulas, I'll be getting some professional help. Not too bad. Trust me. <laughs> OK. This was a fashionable <laughs> shape. <laughs> What someone puts on their face, and why, says as much about an era as art, architecture, or food. If you think beauty is only skin deep, think again. The 18th century was a period of massive ostentation, matched by staggering inequality. It's an era that ended in parts of Europe with bloodshed and revolution. White makeup had been fashionable for centuries. For Tudors like Elizabeth I, it was a symbol of wealth, showing that they'd never had to work outside. And it also covered the signs of aging or ill health. The most popular white makeup was known as ceruse and was made with white lead pigment. By the 18th century, it was common knowledge that lead was poisonous, but despite this, people kept using it. I want to know what it was about lead ceruse that made it so desirable. Of course, you can't buy lead ceruse these days, so I'm getting some help at the University of Kiel. I've asked pharmacist Dr. Su Zhen Wang to make me a genuine Georgian ceruse. So we're going to be making ceruse, which is lead white paint, and it does have some very, very nasty side effects if you use it regularly. Indeed it does. Lead is a poisonous metal. It can be processed to form white pigment, which is the active ingredient in ceruse. Um, it can be absorbed through the skin. It can cause infertility in women. And yeah. if a person actually consumes it or use it for a prolonged period of time, it could lead to deafness as well. And I suppose eventually lead to death. So the thought of people putting it on all over their faces, necks, bodies, day after day after day after day. Horrific. It was, was horrific. It's interesting because by this time, they know that. Yes. But they're still risking using it. Sue's following a recipe that mixes lead carbonate with beeswax and oil. Lead carbonate is more commonly known as flake white, prized by artists for its ability to create brilliant white highlights. Because it's so poisonous, today flake white is only ever used for art restoration. And Sue is using it carefully in a controlled environment to recreate some of the highly prized lead ceruse. So is this it? This is it. Can I try that? Put it on my glove? You can, but let's treat it with respect and care. I will. Okay, here we go. Well, the color is pure white. Oh, it's very creamy. Mmm. That's good. Mmm. It's beauty over health again, isn't it? Yeah, and it has got sheen as well. It does have that lovely, dewy glow. Mm. 
Of course, 18th century beauties didn't parade themselves around brightly lit labs. This was definitely a look intended to be seen in a somewhat softer light. I'm going to compare Sue's lead ceruse with a safe, non-toxic version made using another recipe from the time. So here we have our Venetian ceruse. So this is the poisonous lead version. And here is the non-toxic version. This one's made with French chalk and beeswax, but it could also be made with talc or flour or even bones. So I'm going to use a spatula and have a look at it on a palette just to see how the textures differ. I can see straight away that the non-toxic version is quite shiny. It looks really nice. It's pretty liquidy. Mm, but it seems really smooth, a touch greasy, but it definitely has a nice shine to it. Okay, onto the lead. Ooh, yes. <gasps> nice. Oh, completely different. Yeah, much more opaque, much pure white. You can see it almost makes the non-toxic version look grey. This one is white. Of course it looks like clown paint to us now, but you've got to remember that men and women would have worn this in the evening. So I think I need to see what it looks like in candlelight. We can see straight away that there's a, a slight sheen but it's a beautiful, ethereal glow. The non-toxic version looks slightly grey in candlelight and it's way too shiny. We look back and think now, that's crazy. Okay, they looked good, but they're risking their lives. But is it that different to today? I mean, we all do things which we know maybe aren't great for our health in the name of beauty. It still happens. Now that I've seen what genuine ceruse looks like, I know how to replicate that 18th century ethereal glow with modern makeup. The perfect Georgian look is hard to get right. And just like today, in Georgian times, the public displayed a certain glee when a celebrity's beauty mishaps led to a disaster. A tragic example of this are the Gunning sisters, a pair of beauties who were the Kardashians of their day. Mariah and Elizabeth Gunning came from a relatively humble background, but their great beauty gave them a ticket into the Bon Ton. When they went traveling, people would hire out the rooms of the hotels that they were staying in so they could dangle out of the windows and try and catch a glimpse of them going oh into goodness. their carriages. So it is really an 18th century type of celebrity. The lengths Mariah was prepared to go to to stay in these elite circles became a cautionary tale of the day. It was rumored that she was addicted to lead ceruse and wouldn't be seen without it. We know that she fell ill when she was about 26 or 27 and that this was a long and lingering illness that killed her just shortly after her 28th birthday. At the time, the gossip was certainly that she'd been killed by white lead, so by her cosmetics. Mariah was a victim not only of her own vanity, but of a society where beauty was one of the only ways a woman could make her way in the world. Looking at the grandeur and the drama of these rooms, it's not that surprising that men and women felt compelled to use the transformative power of hair and makeup to really help them make their entrance. Imagine coming to a ball here, it must have been extraordinary. All of the beautiful dresses rustling, the diamond necklaces gleaming in the candlelight. It was also a very, very competitive environment. So wearing your hair just a little bit higher and your complexion a little bit more dramatic would really help you get noticed. Was it worth using poisonous cosmetics for? Some people thought so. 